Okay. Um, we're going to get started over here. So thank you, everyone. Welcome. My name is Nikki Yacovella, and I'm the director of the Outside of Art Fair. It's great to see you all virtually. Um, you're in for a real treat this afternoon. Before I get into the introductions, I just want to kick a few things off. Um, just remind you of a few Zoom etiquette things. You would have entered into this webinar on mute. Um, please keep yourself on mute unless um, you've raised a question and um, you want to speak. Um, if you look at the bottom of your screen, you'll also see there's an option for a QA. and a um, If you do have questions throughout the talk, you can um, please type them in the Q&A section. Um, and you should also have a hands up. You should also see a hands up uh, uh, request there as well. Um, we will have time for questions at the end of the talk, but if you would like um, to raise a question during the talk, we're also open with that as well. Um, so please use either the Q&A function or the raise hand function. Um, so moving right along, um, it's an absolute pleasure to introduce you to this talk. Um, this is Donald Ellis Gallery's presentation of ledger drawings. Um, this talk coincides with an online viewing room that is currently on the Outsider Art Fair website. Um, the online exhibition is titled Ledger Drawings from Fort Marion and, be and Beyond. Um, this is up for another week until December 6, 7, December 7. So if you haven't had a chance to look at the exhibition, please go on there. The works are exquisite. You will see images of some um, in this talk this afternoon. Um, it's also incredibly fascinating. The uh, historical information that is also provided really helps um, highlight the significance and importance of this body of work. Um, so to kick things off, I'd like to introduce you to Donald Ellis, Donald Ellis Gallery. He's an internationally renowned dealer in the field of historical Native American art. Since the mid seventies, he has placed key pieces in many private collections, corporations, and museums all around the world. Uh, some of those museums include the Metropolitan Museum of Art here in New York, the Quai Branly in Paris, the Art Gallery of Ontario in Toronto, and the Museum of Fine Art in Boston. That's just to name a few. Um, he's a real recognized authority in the field. Um, Donald has been regularly featured on, um, as an appraiser of Native American art on the PBS show, Antiques Roadshow. Um, and the Gal Donald, Donald Ellis Gallery is also exhibited in a number of art fairs, also including the Outsider Art Fair, both in Paris and New York. So Donald, thank you so much. Um, I'll hand it over to you. You can introduce the rest of the panel. Thank you, Nikki. Um, first is Nadia Ayari, who is, uh, has been working I, we've been working together for, I think, about six years now, Nadia, is that correct? Yes. Um, primarily at art fairs, but beginning uh, earlier this year, she's come on board in a larger capacity um, as a research assistant and <clears throat> um, friend, mm -hmm. although she's been a friend for some time. Um, I'm delighted she's done a, quite a bit of the work for this exhibition um, and is our <clears throat> ledger specialist. Um, so thank you, Nadia, for all of your work. Yeah. And I do want to say once again, um, I'm not blowing my own horn, I'm blowing my team's horn here. I'm exceedingly thrilled by <clears throat> the exhibition. I think you've done an extraordinary job. Um, which brings us to Ross Frank. Um, Ross is a professor at the University of California, San Diego. He is uh, the founder of something called the Pila or the Plains Indian Ledger Project, which is an extraordinary um, situation where he has taken upon himself and his team to attempt to record, digitally record all of the known complete ledger books uh, that we know about either in institutional collections or private collections. It's been ongoing for some time. Um, Donald Ellis Gallery tries to assist um, that project whenever it can. 
And also, and perhaps most importantly, Ross is not only a friend, but he is, as a personal aside, the son of the extraordinary, but no longer with us, Larry Frank, who was a enormous influence on my life. He was a filmmaker, a writer, a poet, and one of the extraordinary collectors and early dealers in my field. And he, um, one of the biggest influences in my life and my career. And now Ross is my friend also. So on that note, on let's that move note. On that note, hi, I want to say hi to everyone and welcome you all. Um, it's nice to see so many of you here attending. Um, I'll, my name is Nedia, as uh, Donald mentioned, and I'll be your moderator uh, today, which means that I'll be asking questions of Donald and Ross, peppering my opinion throughout, um, while also sharing my screen so I can take you through the images we'll be discussing today, the works we'll be discussing. Um, worth noting is that most of the works from the exhibition um, most of the works that I'll be presenting in the slideshow are from the exhibition. Some are from the Donald Ellis Gallery inventory, past and present. And um, some or two are from the PILA website, which now you know um, uh, Ross was in, is involved with. So to start off and to contextualize um, the work, the work that in the exhibition, the which is, starts at Fort Marion in 1875. We're gonna be showing Native American drawing from before Fort Marion. And to start, I'll start sharing my screen. Um, and um, so we'll be, um, we'll start with uh, war books. And I'd like to ask Ross if he can tell us uh, more about war books. If he can tell us what they are and what they served as. Hi everybody. Um, and. Uh, Thank you, Donald Ellis and Donald Ellis Gallery and Nadia for inviting me. Um, so more recently, there's been a, a discussion about Plains Ledger art uh, with the acknowledgement that it begins before Fort Marion, which is when most of us understand uh, or uh, it, when it comes into the, the minds of most of us. <clears throat> but um, the the pictographic representation on paper begins probably around uh, 1860. And it really is about warrior exploits. Um, and so the war books designation, which is one that Castle McLaughlin um, at Harvard Peabody uh, came up with, um, is about the early phase when um, these books were, these accountants ledger books were basically uh, either taken on the battlefield or in raids, or they were given in annuity supplies. Uh, and Plains uh, warriors uh, together uh, drew on the ledger books their uh, prize exploits in recent battles or skirmishes or raids. Um, so so uh, we sometimes the books have one artist in them. Sometimes there were a number of accomplished artists in a, in a band. Um, and in any case, the person who drew the exploit was not necessarily the protagonist of the exploit, but had the authority to tell that story communally. So these exploits, exploits were validated by the band or group. Um, and so here you have from the Thai Creek Ledger book, uh, you know, a, um, uh, a uh, looks like we have uh, a Cheyenne uh, warrior who is about to, uh, he's just shot the, the, um, the U.S. Soldier, a, a drover probably uh, from, from the U.S. Cavalry, you can see the Cavalry um, saddle. Mm -hmm. uh, and then he's about to count coup with his quirt uh, as well. Um, so it's, this is this would be a you know a, a, an individual exploit within a, a war book. Ross, uh, briefly, could you, because um, I'm certain most of our listeners aren't aware of this, could you just briefly describe what counting coup is? Yeah. Um, so one is th there's there's a kind of acknowledged hierarchy. It's not written anywhere. Uh, but it really has to do with uh, what the most honorific actions within a battle are. Um, obviously, uh, dispatching the enemy is one of them. But even more important is what the it's a it comes from the French word um, 
counting coup is the uh, striking the enemy with the non-business end of a weapon or a stick, or a, and there are actually coup sticks for doing this. So that you are uh, um, you are opening yourself up to to bodily harm, showing your uh, uh, bravery, um, and your uh, coming out unscathed from this close interaction with an enemy uh, without uh, using your you know the, uh, any lethal force from a weapon. Interesting. And I'm really curious about the, this idea of designation. Who gets designated and how does one gain that authority to, to be the person that represents the events? I would say that this is an area that we, we actually need some more research, but, um, but, it, but it's acknowledged uh, that um, within, within war parties and war parties uh, changed uh, given who uh, elected to lead them and who elected to go with a leader, mm -hmm. um, but within the war parties, it was it was generally known who was a an artist. Uh, right. Sometimes the artist uh, could well, be. We're talking about ability, essentially, correct? Yeah, who the ability and and the, the the you know undergoing the the practice to to uh, create representations. Um, and you know, men had different representational uh, means uh, compared to women. Mm -hmm. uh, so this pictographic tradition was was a men's warrior status uh, position. Uh, but people knew who was able to depict these stories, and either they were within the band or they were told when they got back to someone in the uh, mm -hmm. in the larger group who had the ability to do the the work. Um, I mean, they, uh, we know there, there, are number, there are enough hands, even in the pre-Fort Marion period, that we know that there were many artists that were capable of doing these pictographic representations. Mm -hmm. And we certainly don't know uh, the names of most of them. But you can see on this um, image that there is a, a glyph on top, the buffalo. Uh, so that's the name of this particular warrior whether that is the artist or not is another matter. And that, and that generally takes a, a good bit of, of research and supposition and often looking at, um, at archival uh, um, enrollment lists and uh, to try to get a, a name that might correspond to that glyph. Wonderful, thank you. Great. Thank you, Ross. Um, so, I, so additionally to war books, we also wanted to uh, show you an early ledger book. And here's one um, from, here's a page from the Vincent Price ledger. And I'm wondering, Donald, if you can tell us um, what the historical and aesthetic characteristics of early ledger books are. Um, and I guess in the simplest terms, what you're seeing here is the continuation of what was taking place, well, which began with rock painting, <clears throat> petroglyphs and, and rock art that, that evolved in the, in the prehistoric time, that evolved into pictographic recordings on buffalo hides and teepees and war shirts and the like. Um, so here you're, you're looking at imagery that would be very similar to what you would see on, on uh, hides. <clears throat> and, and, and clothing. Um, this again, there's, can I do this? Yes, I can. Um, <clears throat> again, here is, we have a glyph <clears throat> here and we know that this is Eagle Head. <clears throat> this warrior here <clears throat> is Eagle Head. And an uh, interesting little uh, side note is that Eagle Head was the father of Howling Wolf. And we don't have any Howling Wolf drawings in this exhibition, but Howling Wolf is widely considered to be one of the, the most extraordinary recorders, <clears throat> artists, and was at Fort Marion and Howling Wolf. It's also interesting to note that uh, he's the only artist we know of presently that <clears throat> did this work in all three periods before, <clears throat> before Fort Marion, at Fort Marion, and then in the reservation period. And we have examples of his work from all three of those areas. Um, something else I'd like to touch on briefly is <clears throat> um, the naming of books. We have here uh, the Vincent Price Ledger book and named after the actor, Vincent Price, who was 
uh, quite an extraordinary man, a Renaissance man, a, a cook. He wrote cookbooks. He collected Impressionist art. He collected African art. <clears throat> he was a very early collector of Native American art in the Northwest Coast and other areas, including um, this ledger book <clears throat> that I believe, Ross, was this broken apart in the 70s, do you know? Yeah, as far as I know, this is, was one of the first um, complete ledger books that was taken apart for individual sale um, in the middle, mid or late 70s. And it was also, uh, do we know how many images? It was a large book. I have been collecting images of them and I'm as at about 100 and they're probably around 200. In, uh, uh, well, we have page count uh, as in the, 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 the number you see up here, um, page 72 page. And I think we have that number goes up into the mid 200s, I believe. That does not mean that every page was utilized for a drawing, of course, but, but it was a very large book um, <clears throat> and one of my favorite books. Um, something else, just out of curiosity, and <clears throat> because Ross and I haven't talked about this for a while, but in the Vincent Price book, there are numerous drawings that have this mysterious orb. <clears throat> <clears throat> and we've been trying to uh, ascertain what this orb is for some time now. Um, <clears throat> it's, it, it's, it, it's placed in all different places. It's not a glyph. I don't believe it's a glyph. Ross, have you done any, since we last talked about this, have you come to any other further conclusion about what this, what that might be? Um, uh, this is, uh, I have, I, I have yet to crack this nut, but um, it has something to do with either the time of day or the time of the month. I, I think it's a calendrical thing, but I have not seen uh, any other ledger book that actually nor, has that. Nor have I. Could, could I just say uh, something before we move on? Because once we go past the, the earlier ledgers, it's harder to, to, to notice this. Um, but, but the way the artistry works in a, in a, in a exploit like this one um, is you're, you're focused clearly on the protagonist, right? The, 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 the uh, in this case, Cheyenne warrior on the horse with the huge lance, uh, eagle head from the name glyph, the, the shield. And you notice there's a drop uh, on the shield that, that says something about um, its preparation for battle. Um, obviously that feather wouldn't be, or that drop wouldn't be hanging straight down if the horse was moving like that. But we're, we're really given the motion of the animal um, and the warrior coming into this, uh, into this frame. And uh, even though the action from a, from a say, a, a kind of Western point of view would be the sharp end of the lance uh, uh, dispatching the, the warrior who's lost his shield, who's, who's so in awe, he's lost his shield. And then the other gentleman who's reloading his gun um, seems to be a little bit confused and is uh, ramrodding it behind his back. Um, so in other words, you've got this idea that the, the, the power of the warrior is so immense that he's really uh, taken uh, the, the, the enemy's um, attention and ability to respond uh, to task, uh, taking them apart. Um, so what, what you have here is kind of a manifestation of power as opposed to simply showing a brute act of violence, right? It's about the power that the warrior has amassed that allows him to be in the position to overawe his enemies. Fascinating. Thank you. And we do have a couple of questions um, coming in and I'm wondering if this, this is one of the first um, that we'll answer live. So did you ever see evidence of the drawings that were abandoned because the artist made a mistake in the ledger books? Um, you see practice drawings. <clears throat> um, one of the things that I wanted to mention, and, and I don't know how scientific this is, but um, back to the previous conversation about, you know, who, who, who was made to make these drawings. And, and to me, one of the, the aspects that suggests that it was based on artistic ability was the fact, at least for me in my eye, 
this is really the only area in my field that you don't see bad drawings. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you see exceptional drawings and you see good drawings, but you almost never ever see what I would consider a bad drawing. <clears throat> Interesting. Uh -huh. So I don't know if that answers your question, but um, you know, we recently acquired a group of drawings um, by an artist by the name of warrior artist by the name of Cedar Tree. And in the drawings are the, a group of, I think, 12 or 16 drawings of a simple horse uh, coming from the left hand side of the page um, where he appears to be practicing. Uh, which is which is against convention. What you guys will notice is that the convention is usually for the protagonist to be entering from the always. from the right to left. Um, and so in the cedar tree pages where he's practicing representing the horse coming on, on from left to right, then there's one other page where he's practicing it right to left. And that's a very tentative drawing. Um, so and but they are I find them to be a very interesting inclusion in the ledger books, like though a breakdown sort of of the language. And um, apparently that, that was my first real experience with a group of them. And Ross and I had a conversation recently about that because I asked him and he said that it's not uncommon for there to be what appear to be sort of practice drawings in the midst of complete ledgers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There are even some, uh, there are even uh, some where you can see that the placement of a figure has actually been changed in the act of drawing. So the drawing has been completed, but you can see the, yes. the change that was made uh, in process. Exactly, the adjustment. Okay, so we'll move along to um, the next period and the period that the exhibition uh, is, takes as its beginning point, which is um, the Fort Marion series. So from 1875 to 1879, a group of over 70 warriors um, from different nations, from the Kiowa, Chi Southern Cheyenne, Arapaho, and um, Comanche nation were sent to Fort Marion um, for incarceration without trial. And um, I'm wondering, Ross, if you can set up sort of the, let us, let us know what the conditions that led up to that incarceration were. How, how were different warriors chosen for imprisonment? Well, there's been some research about this. Um, uh, it, it was a combination of, of uh, uh, Lieutenant Pratt, uh, who was in charge of, of arranging for the prisoners to be selected, um, the uh, consultation with, the, with the, the, the military about uh, who the quote unquote ringleaders of the Red River War were, um, and then um, to some extent, uh, individual tribes, uh, tribal bands uh, apparently presented people. Uh, and this is probably why many of them were quite young uh, um, to be their representative uh, uh, prisoners. So it's kind of a combination. Uh, there was never any, any trial, uh, um, you know, uh, comparisons to uh, Guantanamo are not, uh, are not inapt here. Um, and uh, um, the 72 that were uh, finally marched uh, from Port Sill uh, to the railhead uh, to take the train to Port Marion uh, were, were this uh, group of people who were either selected by uh, their people or uh, had been um, marked uh, for um, uh, punishment uh, due to something that they had done. And there was a whole list of, of quote unquote depredations uh, that the military accused the, each of these uh, people for. Mm -hmm. uh, and we know from various accounts that it was a quite an ardent journey um, from uh, Bill in Lawton, Oklahoma to Port Marion, which is on the East Coast in St. Augustine, East Coast of Florida. Can you tell us, can you describe the journey to us a little? Can you tell us how long it took, for example, how did they get there? This is for me? Yes, yeah. yes. I, I, had des I had designated it for Donald, but he passed it on to you. Okay, um, <laughs> so, uh, so again, th this has been pretty thoroughly documented, but, but um, uh, the, the uh, uh, prisoners were marched uh, with a military escort um, from Fort Sill to uh, the railhead, which was basically just an open station 
uh, in the middle of Kansas, as far as I understand it. Um, and then um, and then they were uh, taken by train and um, both in the march across uh, from Fort Sill and on the train stops, there was um, a lot of, um, of people interested in watching the prisoners go from one place to another. So, so there's uh, a considerable there, uh, um, and I, I don't actually remember the number of days, but we're talking about you know over a week's journey uh, from Fort Sill to Fort Marion. I've, I've, read, uh, I've read two weeks and then sometimes I read six weeks. So it's, some, it's hard to sort of know exactly. Um, because it, 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 they, you know, they, the last part of the, they go by, um, by rail, um, but they march by rail, uh, um, and then there's part of the journey that uh, um, to Fort Marion, uh, the last part uh, they went through uh, on a boat. Yeah. There was no rail line at that time. The rail line didn't go into Florida at that right. time. So. And then by steamship, which we have a drawing of here, um, was the end of their, their journey. Um, and, and as we look at these drawings, I'm always struck by um, these, these tools of modernity that were the tools of capture, essentially, of these, of these uh, Native American warriors. And I'm wondering, and to contextualize things for, for the attendees, by this year, by 1875, for example, the Brooklyn Bridge was already many years underway, sort of an emblem of modernity. And I'm wondering if each of you, like me, um, how you interpret these in that sense. For me, they're evidence of the intellectual sophistication, visual, intellectual, visual sophistication of these warriors, their ability to, uh, to depict these architectural and design elements, the bridges, the steamships, the, um, the trains, um, that would have been really overwhelming to people of many, many backgrounds at the time. I'm wondering if, if what your thoughts are on that. Uh, well, one of the things I'm struck by is uh, um, memory. Um, the train drawings in particular, I find astonishing. And they would have, they would have uh, done these obviously after the journey uh, from memory um, at Port Marion. The boats are a little different because St. August, the, the fort there, Fort Marion, is right on the water. <clears throat> and they would have seen steamships and sailboats going by while they were imprisoned. Um, sort of an interesting note. I, I also, we talked about this a little bit in a conversation we had yesterday, but I want to bring it up again. Um, if we can go back to the boat drawings, Nadia, the the I first experienced the ocean when I think I was 13 years old. <clears throat> I had obviously been aware of the ocean because of films and photographs and things, but it didn't take away. I, re I distinctly remember my first experience of standing in the surf, listening to the pounding surf, the vastness of it. And I was in complete awe of it. So for a moment, imagine what it was like for a person of the plains. Mm -hmm. to see that for the first time. I can't imagine what that's like. And, and, and on another note, I want, just wanted to point out this small thing, but interesting thing. I had a conversation with, <clears throat> with an art dealer, the, the extraordinary Giza Capitan, who we did an exhibition with in Cologne with these drawings a few years ago um, about these, this drawing here. This is a double-sided drawing, Recto Verso. And, and, and she mentioned how the artist here has made the water, particularly on the left, look more like the grasslands of the plains than, than the ocean, which is an interesting little aside. Mm -hmm. Ross, anything you want to? Yeah, I'd like to uh, point out also that um, there's something really interesting here. Um, it also happens on, the, on the, uh, the trains where they're kind of an assemblage of parts and you can actually see um, how some of those parts move uh, so like the engine but also the um, the uh, the second car which is also where the uh, the coal comes from and there's this really interesting uh, pattern on the on the which almost looks like the steam coming out of the boiler uh, it, it's it's just really interesting the way that's done um, yeah. and also the 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 um, the the 
how would you put it? The um, the um, rearranging of time and geography and space to get both a bird, bird's eye view and a uh, um, a kind of uh, map. Uh, yeah. of how you would navigate the space at the same time, um, making, you know, I, so this is kind of a, a twisted view where you're getting a bird's eye view, but also a, a map of how people moved across the area um, and different, um, different uh, pieces have different spatial uh, um, sizes in order to show their kind of relative uh, schema in this landscape. So I think this is, it's a really interesting thing. And if we go back to the, to the water ones, um, there's something about in, in both the land ones and the water ones about movement that's really interesting. So um, I, I take the, um, the smoke here that's coming from the, the steamships Mm -hmm. um, and in a number of Fort Marion drawings, you have visionary um, uh, drawings that use the same cloud-like formation. So it's as if the power of the steamship coming through the smoke is mm -hmm. similar to the kind of power that one gets from, from a vision. Um, so th there's this understanding of, of where power comes from that I think is really interesting too. Um, above and beyond the water itself with all that movement, the mm -hmm. land, but movement. <laughs> yeah. and, and we got another question. We're getting many of them and I don't, I, we won't be able to answer all of them, but thank you so much. Keep, keep sending them. Um, I think one that leads us into the next section which is really interesting is, um, were these uh, Koba drawings part of a book or were they loose? Uh, these were loose. <clears throat> And with no evidence of, uh, you can usually tell when a when a book was uh, taken apart, <clears throat> but there's no evidence in these drawings um, mm -hmm. of them ever having been in a book. Uh, the pages aren't numbered. <clears throat> there are no holes where it would have been bound together. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and the history of these uh, drawings uh, were uh, from uh, these were acquired from a family whose grandfather or great-grandfather, I don't recall, was uh, a member of the U.S. Senate during uh, in the late 1870s. And I know we're going to move into this now, but we know that at Fort Marion, uh, a lot of what Pratt did was, was uh, give these as gifts to dignitaries as part of his big overall plan of, of uh, what he was up to. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I'll just like to add that also there is this particular format that we find um, in some of the Fort Marion drawings, these, this preferred sort of size and the blank, the blank page. These um, are larger, larger than general accounting books and obviously unlined paper also. These, this is paper that Pratt had given um, the warrior artists. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, we know that Artists, warrior artists began drawing at Fort Marion. Um, we've settled on the number 26, but obviously that, that changes depending on the accounts as well. Um, and I'm wondering, Ross, if you can tell us um, who drew while, while at Fort Marion and if that had anything to do with their status and age. Um, so we have uh, some 20, uh, one, some people say it's as many as 23 uh, of the 72 prisoners at Fort Marion uh, who we know were artists. And um, uh, most of them were younger. Uh, there's some question about one of the older members, uh, a, a Kiowa uh, man named Bad Eye, uh, mm -hmm. whether he uh, can be identified with spe a specific uh, ledger book. There's one. Um, uh, that's in the Pila project um, uh, that is attributed to Bad Eye. And it, there's some question about whether it's the same person who was at Fort Marion. But if so, then we, ha we do have some um, older uh, artists. Howling Wolf has slightly more experience than some of these younger uh, folks that we, that we know the names of, you know, that we know the work of. Um, th there is a lot of 
Uh, okay, so so what's one of the things that's interested, interesting about Fort Marion is it's the first time where there's kind of a direct uh, patronage artist um, uh, situation because not only did Pratt encourage the drawing and use the drawings uh, to curry favor with officials that would uh, maybe see the experiment at Fort Marion uh, replicated in some manner after the the imprisonment of these of these uh, 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 72 uh, but uh, the works were offered for sale and and they could be commissioned so um, you do have people commissioning whole ledger books these are sketchbooks that were purchased commercially uh, at in this online uh, paper that you have here Mm -hmm. uh, but also, clearly, there were many works that were done individually and sold in individually to uh, to members of the public who came as tourists uh, and um, purchased it, uh, directly from the from the artist. Mm -hmm. um, what's interesting is that, and, and and you know, it's not so different from from uh, art today. <laughs> Um, and and the the world of of, of Native American artists, um, the the concerns of the art depend on um, an understanding of Indianness from the outside as well as from the inside, um, right? So the tourists are interested in buying the art because it's Indian art, right? Because it's from these prisoners. Um, the the artists are interested in depicting their own. Uh, concerns and some of those concerns really did have to do with their own status within Fort Marion, and mm -hmm. that's always linked to their status as uh, people and warriors from the communities they came from. Uh, so many of those um, associations that really are about ledger art, not just about Fort Marion ledger art, are still in uh, the drawings that we have here. And and you know a buffalo hunt here. Um, that you have showing on the screen is a, a really good example of that. Um, obviously, there are no buffalo at Fort Marion, St. Augustine. Um, and this is not remembering uh, uh, something as a nostalgic piece, but remembering something that's critical to understanding uh, who the Kiowa are in relation to other, other than human beings. Um, buffalo, which uh, forms such an important part of of Plains culture. Uh, so showing uh, the buffalo um, milling around in these two different uh, wonderful um, uh, spatial organizations. So we get a, a near view and a far view, uh, mm -hmm. not using perspective, but using this kind of um, bifurcated frame. Yeah. Well, so I'd like, I'd like to point out here, and uh, Ross, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe, believe here at Fort Marion, we, we start to see the beginnings of, of uh, representations of landscape in a more real, not that this is necessarily a realistic form, but in, in before Fort Marion, when landscape was, was attempted to be represented, it was in, in highly abstract form, a simple hill perhaps, or a simple tree. But here we, we do start to see the beginnings of landscape in, in ledger drawings. That's correct, yeah. So um, a lot of, go ahead. Who was that? Oh no, I was just in this, that it's me. I was just noticing there's a few questions in there, good ones about um, the media and materiality. I don't know if now it's a good time to talk about it. Yeah. How, how, did, how did the artists gain access to these materials? Um, what are some of the conservation challenges that you find come with that? Um, Donald, do you wanna? Uh, well, before Fort Marion, you know, at Fort Marion, the paper and the and the and the uh, materials were provided by by the fort by by Pratt. Um, before Fort Marion, um, trade, you know, the the books were originally occasionally taken in battle. Um, uh -huh. The 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 ledger books themselves, the earlier ones, not just the earlier ones, but the one sees more commonly in the earlier ledger books that they're actually used ledger books. You can okay. see you can see on the what would be perhaps the front page, uh, the, the recto of, of accounting, you know, writing of, of you know how many sacks of sugar, et cetera, et cetera. And then the drawing will be on the opposite page, or I'm sorry, uh -huh. the back page, sometimes right on top, superimposed right on top. 
Um, yeah. Again, the materials would have been obtained uh, in trade. Um, <laughs> And, and are there any photographs I think I've seen of, of, of the artistic process? Has that been documented? Not that I'm aware. Ross, are you aware of any photographs? I know of, I know of photographs of uh, uh, people working on winter counts and hides, but not, yes. not, not, ledger not early ledger books that I know of. Um, yeah, interesting. Um, the interesting. conservation side is, is actually also interesting. In general, the materials that that were furnished to the Fort Marion people, they were um, fairly high quality sketchbook paper. So, if they've been, if the the books themselves or the paper or the sheets themselves have been properly taken care of, uh, they really hold up quite well. Obviously, sun, you know, is is uh, light is a big is a big issue. No different However, than different. It, they're crayon, they're, they're, some, are, some are crayon and most are colored pencil and colored pencil doesn't tend to fade unless it's subjected to real um, harsh light for a long period of time. Uh, mm -hmm. But the paper itself doesn't really tend to get too brittle. I have seen um, books that were uh, done um, in uh, other um, kind of prison circumstances that were done on less good paper and that uh, paper that has some acidity and there they begin to get brittle and can start to flake away. So um, that can be a problem, but the accountant's ledger books were also meant to withstand a good bit of use. And so the, the quality of paper that the, the government and the suppliers furnished was generally pretty high. Thank you. So I have a question for everyone, for our attendees, and I know you didn't see that many Fort Marion uh, ledgers yet, ledger drawings yet, but I'm wondering if you can quickly in your Q&A tell us if there's any scenes that you notice or absent that you perhaps maybe saw in the first slide um, from the Fort Marion period, an example of which. I know. Can I answer? No, yes, you can answer. No, I'll, we'll leave it to the attendees. Leave it a little bit. Um, one of the things I'll, 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 one of the things I'll touch on, one of the things that you do not see well, I, I should, maybe I shouldn't be so definitive. I don't believe you see is conflict between Native Americans in the in the U.S. military. That's exactly and right. That's, that's something that you you start to see at Fort Marion and increasingly see in the reservation period because it was it's a, it would be considered an act of guilt uh, um, and it was shied away from. And you do see it occasionally. Uh, the gallery currently has an extraordinary muslin, which is essentially a an eight, an eight foot ledger drawing on muslin rather than on a smaller piece of paper where you where there's numerous battle scenes between the Cheyenne and the US military. Um, but that's quite rare. Yeah. And and just to drive home that point is it's important to remember that the warriors were responding and shaping their products. And I'm quoting, uh, I'm paraphrasing the great Candace Green here, anthropologist who's done a lot of writing on this. They were shaping their products to fit oh. the situation and to fit the needs and expectation of the market while giving their own ideas on what they believed art is. And I think that that's really important to know. Um, so Donald, will you tell us a little more about uh, the general who was in charge of the fort and his, uh, Gen Richard Pratt and uh, specifically his colonial practices and their role in shaping uh, the dissemination, the shaping the drawings, their creation and their dissemination. First, I just want to say that this is an incredible drawing. I love this drawing. Um, so this is a drawing uh, at Fort Marion uh, attributed to Chief Killer. Um, I believe we'll have another Chief Killer drawing a little later on. Um, and so you see here, uh, uh, Pratt was uh, actually, Ross, a quick question for you before I go on. Um, he, in the literature, he's Lieutenant and Captain. Do you, what, what's, how's that work? Do you know? Did he become Captain? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he got promoted um, at Fort in, Marion. Yeah, it, it is, as part of the process of setting up Fort Marion. That's what I figured. So here we have, uh, here we have. We know that Pratt uh, took the shackles off the prisoners and and rid them of their Indian clothing and dressed them uh, in Western style. Um, included them in policing themselves. Uh, he was, in one hand, imagining himself as being progressive. Um, Pratt had, he was a man of uh, 
strong, if misguided opinions about taking the Indian out of the Indian in order for them to survive and, and assimilate into Western culture. And Fort Marion was the, essentially the beginnings of that grand experiment for him that, that culminized in, in the uh, Carlisle Indian School after, after this. Um, so here you see the prisoners dressed in Western garb. This here is Captain Pratt. Um, this is, is it Mr. Wolf or Mr. Fox, I'm sorry, who is an interpreter. Um, and this is, this is interesting. This is, because uh, uh, these are all annotated here. This is the word chief, which is written probably by Chief Killer. Um, it's, it's certainly a native hand writing here, whereas this is probably Captain Pratt's uh, hand. Um, and this chief is, is the general. This is a general who's come to visit Captain Pratt at Fort Marion. Um, so again, he, uh, this was the beginning of Pratt's uh, experiment into, into uh, education. A number of the warrior artists learned to read and write. Um, also, you know, Christian religious uh, instruction. Um, yeah. It was the beginning of, of uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. How do you say it? <laughs> um, yeah. Um, Ross, anything to add to that? Um, just to, to note that um, many of the sketchbooks have very similar uh, um, uh, incidents in them. Uh, this this one is not similar to any of the others, but but most of the books do have a presentation um, uh, scene where there is some uh, uh, speech oratory lesson um, or general review that uh, mm -hmm. brings dignitaries that uh, so you get to see over the different ledger books, the different artists, um, how they depict the group of prisoners together and how they depict the dignitaries. It's an interesting uh, contrast in the way people approach the same subject. Absolutely. Okay, so then I'll, I'll share a couple more of these. We've seen a couple of them. We've seen- This is, this is Chief Killer again, same artist as the previous drawing. And this is the Verso and this is um, uh, at Fort Sill, the Kiowa camp before they were sent, sent off. I um, love, uh, I love this uh, drawing. Um, the representation of the military houses here, the, the, the sort of almost to me, the, this incredible poetry and elegance of the teepees versus this kind of box structure of, 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 the, of, the, of the Western housing. Um, yeah. And I, I have the, no. go ahead, Ross. Oh, I was just gonna say, notice also that the, uh, that the uh, shields that are on those triposts mm -hmm. uh, show whose uh, lodges the, um, the, these you know, were important lodges in the village. Mm -hmm. So they're actually signaling the status of the people who, who are, are camped there. Mm -hmm. And then quickly, I had a whole paragraph uh, that I wanted to tell you, but we're running a little out of time. But I just want to remind everyone that this, though it was a predominantly male uh, space, there were women at Fort Marion, one of which was a warrior who was incarcerated, but we can dive into that or you can do your research on that later. Um, so I wanted to ask you, each of you, um, about your engagement with ledger art. As an artist, when I saw these, um, I was engaged from the first moment, and it's been a great privilege to sort of, as we exhibit these, um, to see artists' reaction to them. And I think it has something with, to do with the economy of gesture, and I can expand on that. But I'm wondering, both Ross and Don, Donald, if you want to tell us what initially drew you to ledger, ledger drawings, and then what keeps you engaged in them? Ross, would you like to go first? Yeah. Um... So uh, I was trained as a historian. Uh, I, I do things that make me look less like a historian all the time. Uh, I'm in a department of ethnic studies and we're interested in, in uh, intersectional uh, um, ways of looking at uh, and relational ways of looking at uh, gender, sexuality, race, and ethnicity. Um, so what uh, I'm always interested in um, 
in, I guess you would call it sources. And here, uh, the ledger drawing seemed to be a source that says something about uh, a native understanding of the world at the time of uh, significant change uh, that you can't um, get that kind of information from any other kind of material uh, and connected to descendants understanding of those histories and uh, the perspectives of, of contemporary artists, uh, uh, native ledger artists and other artists. Um, I think you, uh, you have a really powerful uh, set of counter examples and counter narratives to the, the normal way uh, that we narrativize uh, this particular history. Um, and that le led me to kind of thinking about uh, more of an epistemological issue, and that is how these drawings show uh, not just kind of historical events, but a whole way of seeing the world, which is an alternative uh, that I think uh, should should be uh, respected and understood and, and uh, we should try to um, honor it. Yeah. Here, here. Um, for me, uh, there's not a simple answer. Um, my, I had been aware of ledger drawings uh, since the beginning of my career, although handled uh, an occasional one, they weren't um, a primary focus. I was more sculpturally oriented. Um, but then something happened in 1996. There was an exhibition at the Drawing Center in New York <clears throat> called Plains Indian Drawings. And uh, it set the New York art world, the art world in general on its ear. Um, and I went to that exhibition 40 or 50 times, less to look, I, I was aware of the drawings and, and, and I, don't want to, I don't want to suggest that I didn't go to look at the drawings, but what I was completely and utterly blown away by was the response. I went to watch people look at the drawings <clears throat> because I'd never seen anything like it. I'd never seen such an overwhelming response to art before. <clears throat> and that happened again in 2014. It, so essentially what happened was I, I was, I was after that exhibition, I essentially, I can, I can be a little uh, <clears throat> obsessive, I suppose. Um, <laughs> after that exhibition, I essentially went out and tried to buy every single ledger drawing I could. <clears throat> And I did that for 20 odd years. And in 2014, decided to, we, I sold some along the way to, to, to my better clients, but I had this idea of a big grand project. And, and that began in 2014, we did a catalog and we did our first public exhibition in London at Freeze Masters. And in 35 years of exhibiting art, I had never ever, ever. It was like seeing the ledger drawing show in New York all over again. People were stunned. Mm. <clears throat> totally I stunned. There. I remember. Yeah. It's uh, a lot of time when... Are there, oh, sorry. Are there yeah. any major museums with significant ledger collections? And are there any upcoming shows for museums that you know of? Or? Uh, well, um, first question, uh, Outside of ethnological museums, no, not really. The Hood, uh -huh. has, um, we see them more often in both ethnological museums and also rare book libraries. The Beinecke at Yale um, uh, have uh, ex extensive holdings. Um, one of the uh, missions of Donald Ellis Gallery is to get these drawings into art museums, not just ethnographical museums. Mm -hmm. um, you know, most people don't know these drawings even exist. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You know, we did when we when we did our first exhibition in New York at the Armory Show, we had the the drawings curator at both the Met and the Morgan say, "What the hell are these?" Mm -hmm. um, in oh. terms of, uh, there have been some small exhibitions since um, <clears throat> since the Drawing Center show. The Hood Museum had an exhibition. Stanford Museum had a small exhibition. Um, 
we are Donald Ellis Gallery, my team uh, has come up with, I think, a pretty amazing idea in that uh, we are in the early planning stages of a tour, an exhibition tour of drawings to the communities where these drawings were originally made in North Dakota, and South Dakota, Montana, Wyoming, Oklahoma, in indigenous institutions and cultural centers that we hope will begin subject to pandemics and other things, uh, probably in early 2022. And then mm -hmm. Ross and I uh, recently, very recently in the last week, uh, <clears throat> Uh, began to discuss, we've been discussing for some time, the need for a, another big survey show. Um, there hasn't been one since 1996. And we are in the very beginning stages of hopefully uh, uh, forming a major, major survey show that will sort of act as the follow up um, to the 96 show. Okay. Well, because, um, time we're, because we're running out of time, I'm just going to mm. make sure we um, make sure we get to the post reservation, the post Fort Marion period, which I think is important for people to understand. Um, uh -huh. So, um, Roz, can you tell us what some of the warrior artists did once they left Fort Marion in 1878? Yeah, we have a number. Uh, so, Howling Wolf, as, as Donald also uh, mentioned, um, had a career as a, uh, as a ledger artist after he went back. Mm -hmm. uh, Cheyenne. Um, we have a number of the uh, prisoners who were, um, who continued their education at the Hampton School, which was uh, set up for uh, uh, emancipated Black uh, students, um, out of which um, uh, Pratt organized the first American Indian boarding school at Carlisle, so nearby the Hampton School. Uh, and that became the Carlisle Indian School, which is the model for all the boarding schools that the government set up subsequently until 1934. Mm -hmm. um, some of the students went, some of the uh, prisoners uh, continued as students and a few continued as instructors at Carlisle when it opened. Mm -hmm. And many of them, of the uh, prisoners now students were sent back to the reservation to recruit uh, young people to come to Carlisle uh, in, in, as the first uh, group of students that assembled there uh, in, I think it's 1878 or 1879. Um, and uh, a few, I think, uh, Atalia Donamoe and um, uh, uh, I think, I can't remember the other, um, it's gay, the other oh, Kiowa. Oh. Uh, who came back and probably taught at Fort Sill at the Kiowa Agency. So we have examples of, of uh, Cheyenne and Kiowa returning back to the agency and uh, either um, working there or actually instructing at the agency school. In Koba, the, the artist that drew these went back to the agency after having attended um, Carla, which is why these yeah. are um, and, and, and you know, um, the, this group of, of young men uh, often uh, uh, succumb to tuber tuberculosis and other uh, um, health issues back on the reservation. Um, and no one's ever quite done the work to figure out whether this is connected to their being prisoners at Fort Marion for a few years. Uh, or what the factors are, but I, I mean, a number, number of these artists died fairly young as well. Mm -hmm. Just to point out on the Koba to the, to the right here, the scraffito where you see the legs of the students which are behind the green banco, and then mm -hmm. they're blue that had been, he changed his mind, or there's an example where he changed his mind instead of showing the blue on the outside, he shows the green and then uh, shows the, sort of shadows of their legs as they dangled on the other side of the bench. Perhaps Nadia, you can just scroll through a couple of drawings here. Yeah. And um, Donald, so can you tell us a little more about uh, characteristics of reservation period drawings like this one, which is from Cedar Tree, this one from the McNider, another one from McNider. Um, well, we're showing all a bit of the same here. One of the things that you start to see and Ross is certainly much better qualified to speak on this, and I'll, I'll, I'll start it off, but uh, 
when Ross talked earlier on with war books about, uh, 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 well, not just war books in the early, early pre Fort Marion drawings about, about the, the, the accumulation of power and, 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 the, and how that's represented, that power obviously changes significantly um, in access to that power once they were on reservations. So you start to see a change in what's being witnessed in, in you see uh, the frequency more hunting scenes in the, in the, in the chief killer with the turkeys as an example. Um, although that was probably done at Fort Marion. Um, so they're still trying to, to, to obtain power and, 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 and represent themselves in that way. Um, so you, you do start to see slightly different themes, not just, and you also see, uh, more scenes of, of again warfare between intertribal warfare and very little of, of uh, warfare between the military and <clears throat> and the, the indigenous peoples. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would, I, I would just quickly say that um, hunting, courtship, uh, and courtship. ceremony are equi courtship. are equivalent. Um, to battle exploits, even in the pre-Fort Marion war book period. Mm -hmm. But you see more of the military stuff because that's what, that's what people were doing. They were defending their communities um, you know, in, in a time of, of tremendous uh, change in movement and violence. Mm -hmm. um, so, those, so you do have some courtship scenes and some hunting scenes before uh, in the earlier ledger books, but on the uh, reservation, you can't fight, right? <laughs> you're on the reservation, you're under, under essentially military control. Um, an agent is there. Uh, so these other ways that males can show um, to gain power become paramount, the courtship, the hunting, and, and involvement in ceremony. Yeah. The attainable ways, right? Yeah, and then and and then, but at the same time, you have the leftover of of people who were in the military, often who became scouts for the U.S. military, still um, uh, uh, handing down their stories of uh, exploits when they were able to do that. But that does fade out during the reservation period during the, the 1880s, basically. So I'm going to skip skip ahead a little bit. And um, these are these are works from the exhibitions from the Julian Scott uh, ledger. And ask you, Ross, if you can tell us. Um, and this is uh, just for everyone to follow. This is the extraordinary uh, Henderson ledger that uh, Donald went back to see over and over. That was included in the in the drawing center show um, that Donald went back to see over and over. And um, my my sort of one of the final as we wrap up a little here. My final question to Ross is, um, how did in the reservation period, these drawings continue to transition from native owners to non-native owners? So um, again, I think there's a lot of work to be done here uh, on the kinds of patronage and the way that uh, 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 ledger art moved from native hands to non-native hands. Uh, so we know the, the introduction of the sort of touristic um, patronage that Fort Marion uh, engendered. And it does seem like that experience uh, made more people aware. There are many uh, situations of uh, 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 Cheyenne, Lakota, um, Arapaho, uh, um, Prisoners, at, you know, who were people who were uh, in prison for, for um, crimes that they were, um, and so while waiting in prison, they were actually given ledger books, uh, and uh, um, this a kind of uh, patronage. Um, so we have, uh, so so that that's that material goes into non-Indian hands, although it comes out of the the ledger the ledger tradition. Also commissioned. Uh, there was we have we have lots of instances. Well, a number of instances of, of commission. The is it, I'm having a seniors moment here, Ross. The uh, the thaw ledger. It's Black Hawk, correct? Yeah, the Black Hawk. Right in times of in times of of, of difficulty. That was apparently a very hard winter, and the the trader gave him the paper and offered to pay uh, in trade or in 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 funds for each drawing, and then bound them together in a book. We have examples of that. Um, uh, 
so um, uh, there's there's a whole it, it's it's it you know at, at the same period we have for example the um, the TP liners that were done um, in the same way people use TP liners for their own TPs but they also uh, through patronage, uh, did them for non-Indian um, purchasers. Um, and it, hence, a lot of this material uh, shows up in non-Indian hands uh, now um, uh, uh, after two or three generations within a family. Um, mm -hmm. and, and this is a, a really interesting example too, because it shows on both sides of the same piece of paper and notice it's, you know, it's an old ledger in and of itself. Um, on the right hand, uh, someone in ghost dance shirt. So we're talking then the late 1880s, you know, right, uh, right around 1890. And then on the other side, an, an actual act of stealing a horse um, from the 1870s, according to the to the um, the caption that was written by someone else, obviously. Uh, but but you know, uh, given these two incidents in a person's life that are still being depicted on the reservation as um, you know part of their own identity and, and history. And, and beyond if, beyond all of the uh, the historical aspect, though, just an incredible drawing, I mean, just astonishingly good drawing. I mean, the movement of the horse on the left versus the, the gait of the horse on the right. And, uh, you know, this, 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 this could be, look like the horses in Lascaux Cave. Mm -hmm. I, love, yeah. I, I love this drawing. So it's, it's a little past, it's a 308. Thanks for bearing with everyone. Um, so we'll yeah. have time to open up for questions. We have a lot of questions here. We'll take- I want to also quickly say, if, uh, you know, we, we were running near the end here, actually over uh -huh. time. Um, and anybody who's asked a question that isn't addressed, we will we will address it after afterwards uh, through email. Absolutely, absolutely. And um, I, actually, um, could I just answer one that was asked early? But I think it's actually a useful thing just to to have on record here. Um, the question was uh, what it's a two people ask uh, parts of the same question. One was how do the ledgers fit within the return of Native American artifacts? And then the other was, I've been wondering if the Fort Marion drawings from captivity should be deemed NAGPRA eligible or perhaps other drawings captured from battlefields versus those that were sold gifted as those from Fort Marion. And I, I, I mean, the, the NAGPRA is a, is a, a, a sort of clunky um, law. <laughs> for the purposes of Native American return. And in particular, um, the, the items of, uh, of um, uh, uh, e uh, either have to be associated with a uh, funerary object or um, uh, uh, critical for the maintenance of uh, Native religion. So from the point of view of NAGPRA, uh, unless these were uh, unless drawings were actually part of a funerary um, uh, situation, they uh, wouldn't fall under NAGPRA. Um, I mean, we can talk about uh, at another, at another, uh, and I've done this before, we had, at another forum, one could talk about the sort of larger um, ethical issues here, and then we get into, you know, another discussion. Um, but that's the, um, there have been a couple cases where uh, there has been an investigation for NAGPRA purposes. The the book, the war book that Castle McLaughlin uh, wrote about um, the, the the moon. I forget the title right now, but um, uh, the autobiography of Half Moon, um, and I think it was decided in the end not to that it was not subject to NAGPRA repatriation. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, unless Donald, Nadia or Ross, you want to address everything, anything else, I think we are over time. And like Donald said, we can, we will certainly address any unanswered questions um, via email after the talk. But um, unless there's anything else to say, I think we will wind it up. This has been fascinating. Thank you all so much. Um, these works are really exquisite and it was a joy to learn more about them. Um, like I said, the, the Outsider Art Fair is hosting the online viewing room until December 7. 
Um, you can see some really great images online there as well. Thank you, Ross. Thank you, Donald. Thank you, Nadia. It was really fun to do this and I will talk to you all soon. Thank you. Thank you all at Outsider yeah. Art. Yeah. Thank you. See you later. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.